You guys all seem to really like the honest descriptions on all the original anime this fall, and I've gotten several requests to cover the sequels as well. So, without much further ado, and without many spoilers, it's time to honestly describe some motherfucking sequels. Also, please don't get triggered, I will be putting my actual opinion and ranking on the screen, so that if you haven't picked up this anime yet, I may convince you or deter you from doing so. If you do like these honest descriptions, and you want more in the future, feel free to let me know which series or whatever you want me to do them on and feel free to subscribe. And since of course uh, you all know about that notification bell thingy, uh, there will be absolutely no need for me to stress the point that it would be really awesome if you pushed it. Wink, wink. Okay, enough of that. First, Shokugeki no Soma and its third season. After the wonderful yet conventional high school shonen sequel that was My Hero Academia, about high school students with rivalries, tournaments, and superpowers, we get Soma, a sequel about high school rivalries, tournaments, and spatulas. Season 3 still shocks the audience with a premise that seems so freaking lame, yet where the pastries serve the purpose of feeling as awesome as the greatest fight scenes, and it also having the highest level of etchy trash making it not mere eshy trash, but eshy genius. In this season, the main character Soma, who is the biggest prick of a protagonist ever since Kid Toki, and we still somehow love the bastard, he's in like the 177,000th cooking tournament of the series, with stakes we've never had before. This time, if he loses, he actually gets expelled, unlike literally every other tournament so far this series. Also, this show continues to be original with the way it went about the tournament because when Soma started, he was losing in the beginning. None of us actually saw it coming that he'd make a comeback in the last second like every other shonen anime ever. That totally caught everyone by surprise because everyone thought he'd lose and get expelled. Kinda. But since that seems cliche AF at this point, and despite it still being very awesome, in the middle of nowhere, we all of a sudden find ourselves in a power struggle for who owns the school, even though there was literally no struggle in this power struggle. Because we live in the world of anime, where the student council holds more power than the staff and headmaster, like literally every Japanese high school ever. I watched enough anime to know that is 100% truth. It's a shame no one watching the show gives a crap about said power struggle and just wants to see cooking because if we give a shit about the political dynamics of a chef school, this can actually be interesting. Well, at least we still have our trusty protagonist still making those awesome decisions despite him being inexplicably stupid because he has a 0% chance of success because don't worry, it'll make him look badass. AF. And where's this series on a romantic level, you're asking? Well, who'd have guessed that the Tsundere's forced to live with the main character? That never happens to Tsundere's ever! But despite all this, fuck you, because there's no way you can hate on the JoJo's of cliche food porn. Kekai, Sensen, and beyond. I would say we continue the story of the blood blockade battlefront, but since there isn't really a story, and it's just sort of episodic skits, of which of course the main characters destroy the bad guys, the word continue would be hard pressed to use even after the massive climax at the end of season one. The only result of season one really is our protagonist is somehow less wimpy. But despite having the Byaku Sharinigan, he still manages to get into the position in half the episodes. Oh my god, how is he gonna get out of this one? Well, one thing amazing about this series is that there isn't that one OP character that breaks the scales and makes things stupid because don't worry, everyone working with Leonardo in Libra is OP like crazy. I already mentioned his mind controlling eyeballs and that's aside from Harry All Might and Male S Death. And in case you're curious about the setting, this takes place in a massive city full of different races where no one likes anyone else. In other words, this anime is a documentary of Brooklyn. And I've lived there for a while, so I know. Next, Himoto Umaru-chan, the second season two. Himoto Umaru-chan. At last, it's been four years since the hell of the first season of Umaru-chan. There's nothing I hate more than walking into the merch hall of an anime convention and being overrun by a plethora of Umaru plushies. Like someone actually wants to buy one of these things. Like someone actually wants to know a person as vile and decrepit as Umaru-chan. Wait, what's this? This is a, sequ a sequel to Umaru-chan? Well, well, anime generally like doing this character development thing where, you know, you start off with a whiny, egotistical asshole of a creature that no one can possibly be fond of, and then eventually you could turn them into a less whiny creature that people can actually endure. What is up, Anime Alert Nation? This is Killer Weebstar reporting live, and let's get right 
into the boobs. The Umaru-chan everyone knew and loved before has finally returned, and the Umarification device has been cranked up to max power. Also in the news, there's been an insanely high increase in suicides among Japanese high school students. The reason for this is unknown, but the only thing tying them together is that they have a younger sister that likes to cosplay. By the way, just disclaimer, that was not actual news. Like most of what Keemstar, I mean Weebstar seems to say. It was a prediction for Omaru-chan season 3. Next, UQ holder Nejima the second. So, actually, I mentioned UQ holder in my original anime list because despite knowing that it was sort of a sequel to Nejima, since it has basically nothing to do with the prequel, I figured you guys wouldn't mind, but I'm proud of you. Thank you all for all three dozen of those comments letting me know that it's a sequel, even though I explicitly mentioned that it was a sequel in my last video. Oh no, no, I don't mean that sarcastically in the slightest, no. I love it when you guys correct me on stuff I actually knew. I mean, in my honest descriptions on Naruto Shippuden, where I was sarcastically poking fun, not in a serious matter at all, do you have any idea how much I appreciated this comment? Basically, giving me a synopsis of the play-by-play -play of the entire series with manga proofs to the chapter as well, because there's absolutely no doubt that I and everyone else scrolling through the comment section would look at each of those chapters to validate validate your points. Well, anyway, because it's technically a sequel, let's get this show on the road. Some people don't like it when a cast is overpowered, especially just the good guy side. Well, every good guy in this series is fucking immortal. While at first glance, this looks like, uh, really fucking stupid, it's done in the most genius way ever, because you know how in most shonen anime, main characters just don't die, but they're still at the end of every single fight, injured so freaking brutally that it makes no sense that they survived, as well as when they're like run through by like two dozen swords in their abdomen and chest, and they lost like like four dozen liters of blood. But don't worry, it missed all their vital organs, so they're totally okay. Well, UQ Holder outsmarted everyone, because now that actually makes sense. They're just immortal. After getting demolished entirely in a battle, the characters survive, because immortality is the true solution to Shonen's anti-continuity. And for those of you non-believers, it says, No, it takes away all worries that something will actually happen to the main characters. Go shove a hang on up your ass. Because it's not like there's risk of main characters dying in your average Shonen either. All that aside, the character dynamics are, uh... Uh, special. We have cliche main protagonist numero uno that's as thoughtless as Goku, as poorly driven as Gon, and with the mental capacity of Luffy. That is if Luffy would be dead. This guy is dumb and blunt as shit. Yet, the next to main character is still in love with him. Spoilers, that next to main character happens to be genderless. No, they don't have the balls to make him gay, and they're not normal enough to make it a girl. That's right, they're edgy AF. And for those of you who are disappointed, but still hopeful because, don't worry, there's a busty vampire lady. Spoilers, busty vampire lady's actually a lolly. This show just knows how to make its twists. You never know what's gonna happen. Three Gatsu, no lie in second season. The prequel is about an overly depressed child. Despite many people doing good things for him, he still felt the urge to cry every like 30 seconds like clockwork. And how, since he's only good at shogi, he uses that to escape his mental burdens by screwing with everyone else's mental burdens because apparently the only reason why you're playing shogi is because you have mental freaking burdens. Now, we're back with another season of Three Gatsu, no lie. We're spoilers. Every character still has their fucking mental freaking burdens. So they play more shogi. That's right, I only compliment the crappy shows. If it's an actual good story, I'm gonna sarcastically fuck with it. Gintama, season 417. Take what I just said about only complimenting the bad shows and dissing all the good ones and disregard that completely because Gintama is an exception to literally every rule, both in the anime itself and as far as reviewing it. Over my time here on YouTube, I've gotten probably over 100 requests to do a sarcastic trailer on Gintama because despite the fact that almost no one actually watched Gintama, and that's really annoying, to be honest. Especially when a season of it's going on and you can't talk to anyone about it, even though it's the best thing airing because no one actually watched it. Whoever did watch it, on the other hand, loves the crap out of it and knows that however hard I try to insult it, it insults itself way better. By default, making me result in ultimate failure. So I'll answer all of your pleas right now. I cannot do a sarcastic trailer on the only anime in history that's more sarcastic than I am. You want an honest description after all that? Okay, they shove swords up their own asses and battle each other to the death <laughs> by flinging poop at one another. Skeptical, are you? Then what the hell do you call this? And I think my point is proven entirely. 
Next, Otsomatsu san's second season. There are many anime in a season that people don't watch. And of those, it splits into two groups. Either the premise didn't seem interesting to you for whatever reason and you didn't pick it up, or you dropped it after an episode or two because it was fairy to dumb, dumb as hell. Otsomatsu san is absolutely in the former category. Because of the art style, basically no one watched it. If I hit the nail on the head, I would appreciate an LOL in the comments to show my true awesomeness and how I can analyze and read situations. If I was wrong and you actually are watching it, I would appreciate an LOL in the comments just because, wow, I was totally wrong. And Osomatsu-san is basically the family guy of anime. Now, after all that is said and done, we can have a fair look at the comments to see how many LOLs there are, just to know how many of you have watched it and how many haven't. This plan, by the way, is foolproof. In fact, it's the exact type of plan someone would think to use in Osomatsu-san. That, my friends, is called a mindfuck honest description, and I nailed it. Next, Hozuki no Reitetsu. Didn't watch it, aside from looking cliche and not too funny. For a comedy, they decided to use the same profile picture for every single season of this bloody series. If a studio doesn't have the originality to change the profile picture in between seasons that air on different years, it doesn't deserve my time. All that ranting aside, let me know in the comments if it's worth me checking out, because I don't know, I trust you guys. Next, Love Live Sunshine Season 450,000. When a new Love Live was announced, every middle and high school student in Japan instantly felt their ovaries explode. Yeah, even the guys. Because this idol crap is so popular in Japan, it essentially transformed every male student in the country into fangirling little bitches. I may be too harsh on it because I don't understand this part of the culture at all, but this is an honest description. And in honest descriptions, the descriptions do not necessarily have to be honest. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense. Next! We love rice. The second best anime I could think of about rice field. Unfortunately, this is the sequel we got. Not the sequel to Francis of the Filth, which is one of the greatest anime known to humankind and also has a lore that somehow between all the insane shenanigans and creepy ass clothing retains more continuity than your average shonen anime. Welcome to the rice fields, motherfucker! Cinderella Girls, another season of one of the most misleading titles anime has ever produced, because this has absolutely nothing to do with Cinderella by any stretch of the imagination. A more appropriate name would have been Girls, because that's literally the anime. The thought process behind this was, okay, guys like girls, uh, here's girls, look at them for 20 minutes, every single week, but it's family-friendly girls. There's no way anyone would want to pass at this chance. Anime of the year. Card Fight Vanguard. You know when you were a kid and there was that one main card game and a few other card games that you played slightly less occasionally, yet still enjoyed, and had friends that you enjoyed these card games with? Well, that was basically me with Yu-Gi-Oh! I was basically the master, and because of that, I obviously watched the anime up to a point, which was not a very good influence on a growing child, watching every protagonist every season cheat their ass off every episode. A heart of the cards, heart of the cards. Nice way to say, set the deck. But anyway, next was Magic the Gathering. I have to say, it was pretty awesome. I obviously had the most annoying deck of all time, focusing on milling my opponent's cards, even though it wasn't the strongest that it could be, but it was definitely the most satisfying, watching my opponent just getting more frustrated than Sonic the Ninja's ball sack as I shut them down with my ultimate defenses as they slowly lost their library. I also played Pokemon because I was basically a master at the video games, and uh, I'll be honest, the Pokemon card game was kind of crap, but it had Pokemon in it, so I was like totally okay with it. Then, taking the place to that one card game I heard of but never actually tried because it looked really dumb and I was in the mood to get into a new card game where you only have like this one main card and the idea is beating out one main card. That's Card Fight Vanguard, gents. Where, where was I going with this this whole history of Nux's card games? Oh yeah, oh yeah. I don't watch the anime of Card Fight Vanguard season 148, but if it's anything like Yu-Gi-Oh or Pokemon, I can safely assume it's total trash, just trying to cash in on a hobby that you have elsewhere. And that's literally every sequel this fall 2017. Wow! I thought the original list would be hard to do, and this one would be the breeze. I was wrong. If you want me to do this again for next season, please let me know in the comments, because researching, writing, and editing these are harder than my average videos, but the fun that I get in making them, and the feedback I get from you guys makes it totally worth it. That is, if I get good feedback. So, I'd appreciate a like, and feel free to subscribe. Also, just throwing it out there, let me know if you want an honest description on every arc of Shokugeki no Soma, because that is likely next on the itinerary of honest descriptions, along with the Naruto war arc, which is in the editing process as we speak. It does, however, seem to be taking a while, so I'm also working on an honest description of every member of the Akatsuki, because that's what you guys voted for on Twitter. If any of you want it faster, feel free to email me if you want to edit it, and also feel free to follow me on Twitter, because that's really the best place for me to get your input, although the comment section works great as well. I also have a Sword Art Online video that's in the editing process that took a really long time, and I mean months. 
when I say a really long time to actually get to this point. I hope you'll all love it. And I have merch that I made for this Order Online video, but I'll be running some early copies. So if you want to grab an SAO t-shirt or hoodie, SAO standing, of course, for Sarcastic Asshole Online, link to that stuff in the description. Thanks so much for listening. I'm crazy pressed for time these days, so I apologize that all of my updating happens at the ends of my videos instead of just making those let's chill with the fan stream video thingos that people seem to be doing these days. But I really appreciate all of your time. I love all of you. Have yourself a most wonderful evening, and I'll see you next time.